This is part two of our interview with Chuck Harkey. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. You were right about that restaurant. They had good tenderloins there. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that recommendation. We've talked a lot about your early years. Uh, we just discussed uh, your involvement, uh, your being drafted mm -hmm. in the Army and uh, the, the short time you spent in Vietnam. And uh, we talked a little bit about the, the process you went through in building the farm, but I want to talk quite a bit more about your life on the farm as well. When you uh, came back from Vietnam, what was the intentions you had, the, the, what you envisioned for your farm? Well, I always wanted to come back here and raise uh, um, kids and raise uh, hogs and raise corn and soybeans. And, and I really felt that politics screwed up two years of my life, and I really didn't want to have anything to do with politics ever again. And so uh, I just dedicated myself to doing my very best we had some notes, we had some uh, expansions, we had some new barns we had put up, we wanted to pay for those things, we wanted to, to buy some machinery and equipment and modernize things just here a little bit from that Super M that I bought to start with. And, and so uh, I just dedicated myself to being a good community uh, citizen, uh, paid my taxes, uh, painted a fence and um, uh, stayed at home and, and raised my family. Um, while we were in the Army, I adopted my son Chris out in Colorado. We got back here, we knew we wanted a little girl, and so we applied through Catholic Charities, and we, uh, uh, we got our daughter Kim. And so we had a boy and a girl, perfect little uh, TV family, uh, mom and dad, and so we decided that uh, uh, we would just become farmers and good citizens. Why hogs? And you grew up on a farm. You had dairy cattle, you had beef cattle, you had hogs, chickens, you had the, everything. Well, we kind of evolved, I guess, in the family farm. When, when the girls got to, uh, got married and, and left, uh, Jerry and I decided we were not going to do this crazy thing like get up 4.30 in the morning and milk cows, you know, twice a day, never go on vacation. And we felt that uh, hogs was just as lucrative and you could... Uh, uh, make money raising hogs as well as uh, milking cows. It was also a time uh, evolving there where you either had to have 50 cows or 100 cows or you just weren't going to do it, just make it. And, and I couldn't see myself milking 100 cows uh, day in and day out. And so we decided, fine, we'll go into the hog production. We, we were good at it. We, we showed good hogs. We had good breeding stock. And so uh, I was just going to raise hogs. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, stay on the end where you just had the breeders? Actually, uh, we, uh, first four or five years of my married life, six years, seven years, we uh, just raised feeder pigs, and then I sold those feeder pigs to uh, uh, anyone who would buy them, it may, mainly my dad or my brother Jerry. Uh, I sold a few other customers, uh, but I finally got so, well, if they're making money at it, why can't I just finish them out? And so we put up a finishing unit to uh, start finishing out the hogs, and I did this in, I think, uh, about 1970 or something like that. Can you describe the finishing unit? Because this is a time, I believe, that there is quite a bit going on in terms of the hog industry. Uh, we looked around just a little bit, and some of the Cargill units that were being put up, a uh, long front slap sloped, you know, and, and but I looked at this thing, why not uh, a pit? And so I, uh, I had one of the first finishing units that had a pit underneath of it, uh, for finishing hogs in confinement. And so we built the slats our, ourselves and laid them in place over a four foot deep pit. And um, uh, it, it was quite innovative. And, and we raised a lot of very good hogs uh, on a 16 by 32 pen with a feeder out front with, with slats and uh, uh, liquid manure and kept them high and dry and clean all the time. And it was it was a good operation. And you say this was uh, innovative for the time? Yes, I think I had one of the first uh, uh, slatted hog operations uh, in in the county. How many hogs were you finishing a, a year? Uh, we were raising about a thousand head a year, and so as feeder pigs, so we decided to finish those those hogs out myself. And from birth to uh, finishing, how long? To finish. Took about six six and a half months. So you're uh, putting through uh, about five hundred at a time then. Uh, actually, I was farrowing at one time. Uh, we we kept expanding the operation to where I had uh, about 300 sows. And uh, wow, um, you do the math: 300. If I had 300 sows, two litters a year, that was 600 litters times eight pigs. That's close to uh, 
five thousand head of hogs per year, fair to finish. That you're cycling through. I was cycling through. Was that one of the largest in this area at the time? It was at, at, at this at one time, yeah, because it was complete farrow to finish. Now there were a couple over in the Altamont area that were a little bigger, but uh, many get to be it got to be just a lot of work, a lot of work trying to uh, um, breed and and, and farrow uh, and wean and then rebreed uh, twelve to fifteen sows every week, fifty two weeks a year. Were you growing all the feed on your on your farm? I was growing all the feed here, putting it in the bins. In 1976, I made things a whole lot easier. Um, I put in an elevator leg, uh, the the stationary mix mill, and then I hooked all the barns together with this flex line pipe that ran above ground, and I took the feed from dialing the corn, the soybean meal. Uh, to the um, other ingredients, just dialing it like like you would uh, set in the oven, and it would put in 1,600 pounds of corn metered in and 300 pounds of soybean meal and some salt and pepper and cinnamon and everything else you added to <laughs> the operation. The secret recipe. Huh? Well, yeah, you know, you, you balanced your ration, and then you simply dialed it, and then I flipped some switches, and... 16 motors started off uh, in sequence, and it would deliver it all the way uh, uh, some 900 feet uh, into the feeders. And so uh, it eliminated my grinding and delivery of feed every day. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to uh, uh, tolerate a, a city kid asking some of these questions. Did you mix both the corn and soybeans in the process before it got to the trough? Oh, yeah. It was all mixed right at the mill. Uh, there was a big auger that uh, ran relatively fast to deliver the uh, so much corn every minute. Let's say it delivered uh, 60 pounds of corn every minute. Well, you only needed about one-sixth that of soybean meal. So there was a smaller auger that ran just a little slower, and it would deliver 10 pounds of soybean meal. And then there was another auger, the same size, but it ran real slow, and it would put the salt and pepper and, and the minerals mm -hmm. in. And so you simply dialed it. I want, in this batch of feed, I want uh, 1,600 pounds of corn, 300 pounds of soybean meal, 100 pounds of this, 100 pounds of that, four different ingredients, and, and I would just turn a switch. Now, after this made so many resolutions, I'd have a ton of feed. Did you purchase this or something yes. you kind of designed no, yourself? No, I, I purchased it. It was called a mix mill. And as long as everything was set right and the moisture was okay and and the motors were running and the belts weren't slipping, it was good. As long as there weren't rocks or bolts in the corn that came through the mill to tear up things, it was great. Well, this is the logical time in my mind, at least. I ask you the question, looking at your hand, you're losing, you've lost one of the digits here. Was... Well, I did that when I was still uh, using a tractor and a feed grinder. Okay. Uh, one morning early, um, January, cold out, frost on the belts, um, and I don't know if my auger had a a guard on it or didn't have one when it was manufactured, but I do know that I was smart enough to figure that if the belts were slipping, the belts were loose, and they ran yesterday when I ground feed, so they must be just a little wet with frost. If I grab a hold of that belt and just give it a little tug to start, it'll take off, and I was right. <laughs> you and, weren't laughing that day. Uh, no, uh, it took off, and uh, I had a pair of leather gloves on, insulated gloves. Yet it tore that knuckle off that mm. finger. So that, that's how I lost my finger. But that's to illustrate just how dangerous farming was, it is. and it still yeah. is today. Yep, it's a, a very dangerous occupation. What did you do? I mean, with that many hogs in operation, um, obviously they're producing a lot of manure. How did you process the manure? Uh, liquid. We, we hauled it. Uh, we had a, a liquid honey tank, manure tank. We would suck it out of the, out of the, out of the pits, uh, with a big six inch hose and, uh, liquid manure and we'd take it and we'd spread it on the fields. Okay. I know that there's been an awful lot of discussion now with these mega farms, mm -hmm. especially these huge hog operations where that is the issue that, that the farmers have mm -hmm. to deal with. Was what you were doing at that time rather routine? It was rather routine, and, and and no one thought that it was odd or the neighborhood smelled because they had hogs too. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, they had dairy cattle, and mm -hmm. everyone knew, gee, you know, we live in the country, and those are country smells, and there are certain times of year when that's, you just put up with it. I mean, you, did, you can drive for 50 miles to the west or 50 miles to the east every spring, and that's all you're going to smell for 150 miles. Now, it seems strange. Oh, what is that smell? Well, that's, that's hog manure, or that's dairy cattle, or that's beef cattle, and they're emptying the barns for the spring. You know, that's organic fertilizer. It is fertilizer. Come on, now give me a break. Uh, yeah, there's a spring smell in the air, and it happened every spring everywhere because everyone had livestock. If they didn't have cattle or hogs or chickens, they had horses to get to town, they had horses to do their farming, and they had manure from those horses. 90%, I'm guessing, 95% of the farmers back when had livestock. It may not have been all in the concentration, but, you know, we see today. But So yeah. from your perspective today, it's hard to comprehend how the public has reacted to that issue? A absolutely. I, I, I simply don't understand it. Sure. Uh, no one likes the smell of a municipal sewer plant try to do without it mm -hmm. I mean it's going to be there uh, do without smell well fine uh, when I was a member of the General Assembly going through this process of the Livestock Facilities Management Act it, it got me that people didn't understand this is a part of what we do now any type of manu most types of manufacturing there produces some kind of odor if you're producing tires, there's an odor. If you're printing newspapers, there's an odor. If you're processing soybeans, processing soybeans, there's an odor. And I said uh, on a committee, if you know, if we're going to outlaw smell, I really think Decatur, ADM, and Staley's ought to shut down and move because that town stinks once in a while. And everybody was shocked that I would say that. Well, yeah, but they wouldn't want to give up ADM or Staley simply because they're paying the $20, $25 an hour union jobs. But when they get out in the country, they've been watching Green Acres too long. They just want it to be, you know, rosy and nice smell and just everything just perfect out in the country. You know, you don't mm -hmm. want... But they want their bacon, they want their pork chops, they want their ham, they want their steaks, they want their fresh country eggs. And they want the money that all of this brings to the state as well, I would think. Right, right. But they don't want the smell. They don't want to put up with this. Hmm. Um, tax, tax base and counties are, uh, are, are well taken care of when with a livestock operation. Mm -hmm. They're taxed. I know that you are innovative in a lot of ways too with the, not just the things that you already talked about. Can you talk about uh, one or two of the things that you uh, possibly worked on that got you a patent as well? Well, uh, you know, um, in, um, I forget what year it was, about 1980, I guess, I uh, <clears throat> broke my ankle. Uh, and, and I had bad ankles my entire life. And so I had an operation to try to fix some problems I had in my ankle. Went to Mayo Clinic. And I come back, and I sat on a hog fence, and I was watching my pigs. And as uh, my pigs were laying under a heat lamp, and all of a sudden, Mom would start to grunt a little bit, and all the pigs would get up, and they would nurse. They'd all get up and nurse at the same time. And then they'd go lay down again. And an hour later, they'd go nurse again. Well, they're all there. Now, the feeding industry, or the hog industry, had little bitty feeders that they fed pigs. And uh, it was only big enough for about three pigs to stand at one time. So if you want them to start eating, they all ate. They're used to eating at the same time. When mom grunted, they got up and they ate. And so uh, they were, of course, drinking their sows and their mother's milk. And that was great, but you had to put them on solid feed eventually. And so I thought what we need is a feeder so that when they want to start eating, they all eat at the same time. It's long enough. So I built a feeder that was 42 inches long and had places for eight pigs to stand there and eat. All right, now, uh, the, the feed that you're starting them on is like a pablum. It's a good-tasting, sweet feed with honey and whey and, and sugars and some corn and soybean meal and it's really t riboflavin it's really really tastes good i mean it's just i could eat a handful of it myself you know they had these little pigs you want to start to eat but 
it would turn sour when it got wet or humid humidity and it's like taking the um, your baby bottle, uh, uh, you're feeding your baby and you're sitting it on the kitchen table, you don't put it in the refrigerator and let it sit there all day, it's going to get sour. Well, this feed does too, and so you have to develop a feeder that's not only big enough for them to all go to, but it's easy to clean out. And so we developed uh, a feeder that wouldn't rust, was easy to clean out, it's called Flip and Feed Stainless Steel, 5, 40, 304, 403, 304 Stainless Steel. Same thing you use Farks and Nash uh, made out of. You mentioned we. We, I had, a, I had a partner by the name of Frank uh, Brummer. He's a welder. And so I went to him with this concept and idea, and, and we built one. We put one together. He was a welder. I was a farmer. So we started a company called Farm Weld Incorporated. Farmer and a welder. Farm Weld Incorporated. <laughs> and uh, we started trying to sell these Cadillac flip and feed stainless steel feeders. And... Uh, we sold about 100 of them in the first three years and at uh, $125 a piece and hogs were $12 and farmers just didn't have the money. They all needed to replace their feeders and knew it. Indestructible, stainless steel, wouldn't rust, wouldn't bend, hard, heavy, last a lifetime, but they were too high. And so uh, as things evolved, I, I got another job all of a sudden in 1985. Which we'll talk about in a bit. Yeah, and anyway, so I, I sold him my my rights and everything to the thing, lock, stock, and barrel for three grand. So, has he done okay with us since then? Uh, sort of. He uh, he ran it for around twenty years, uh, and within a year after I sold him those uh, uh, those rights, um, he was selling a thousand a week, <laughs> and uh, he made a fortune. He's now sold to a Canadian company. His whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel, and I imagine he's worth uh, a minute or two. And I don't envy him at all. I mean, he, he worked hard at it. So. Well, let's get to the uh, the political side of this thing. You obviously have your hands full in the operation you've described. Uh, you're more than busy managing this farm. You've got a couple kids now that you're taking care of as well. How did you get yourself involved in politics? When you had sworn coming back from Vietnam, you wanted nothing to do with it. Well, <laughs> do as I say, not as I do, you know. I uh, got frustrated one day. I was reading the paper at night, and uh, the county, the county board in its wisdom and uh, infinite wisdom was going to consider the possibility of countywide zoning. And then they described a little bit what zoning was. Zoning was where you uh, would have to go into the county board, the planning board, and, and ask them permission to put up a building, because we don't want buildings right next to the township or county road. We didn't want uh, what they call uh, string development along highways, where the bus had to stop on the highways every ten, uh, every ten feet, you know, to pick up kids. It wasn't safe, and and they don't want houses way over here and way over there. Fire departments, fire. It was controlled and structured growth. And so, uh, as, as agriculture, we just couldn't put a pond any place we wanted to, or drain water any place we wanted to, or put up a building that was out of. Uh, uh, out of the wrong. You don't put up a chicken house next to town, all mm -hmm. right? And and so uh, you don't want a dangerous society to have all these chickens there, you know? And so uh, we, wait a minute. I bought this land. Nobody's going to tell me what the heck I can do with my land. If I want to put up a dang good barn, I'm going to do it. So I went to this. They were going to have informational meetings. So I went to one of these informational meetings. I sat there and listened a while and I said, oh, wait a minute, my friends and neighbors, I didn't go to Vietnam to fight for the freedoms to, to, to allow someone else to tell me where I could have been born, get a permit to do it. No, absolutely not. We do not need zoning. However, I know one thing, if you never stand up and say anything, it's going to happen, whether you like it or not, because somebody's got it in their head that it's gone this far. So what we must do as rural members of this county is to pack every meeting and make sure that our voices are heard. As a matter of fact, in the planning stages, we ought to make sure that we've got members on the inside working on the planning and zoning commission just in case we have to have it, we can live with it. I don't know what that would be, but we ought to have somebody there to represent us on the county board and in these planning and zoning meetings. And my neighbors agreed. 
Having said that, <laughs> who did you have in mind of being on the inside? I didn't, but I didn't at all. But uh, my friends and neighbors came to me and said, Chuck, would you serve on the county planning commission? Including my county supervisor, uh, township supervisor. He came and said, Chuck, uh, you're young and so forth. you you got to become involved in this thing because I think your, your heart's in the right place. Okay, fine. So I agreed to serve on the county planning commission. I was elected their secretary. And 14 months later, we presented to the 14 townships in, in Effingham County a planning program uh, for zoning, if we needed to have it. It had to be voted on by the county board. And so we went around, had hearings in all the townships, and I, pre I made every one of them and presented the, the booklet of the county uh, zoning plan. And uh, after every meeting, we took a straw vote, and, and it was just totally rejected by they didn't want to have zoning in, in Effingham County. So we went to the county board, we, the chairman, uh, Mr. Ernest, Ernest Garby, who from, is from Bishop Township, another farmer, uh, and myself, uh, secretary, and we recommended to the county board that they do not adopt the county zoning plan. And they rejected it, and so it was not adopted. Mission accomplished. At that point in time, uh, what were your political ambitions then? Absolutely none. I uh, went, came home here and started raising pigs and kids and, and uh, so forth. The problem was... Um, I had a uh, um, precinct commitment here in Montrose that was getting old, and I found out that he wasn't going to meetings anymore, and so I ran against him and uh, as a precinct commitment, Democrat precinct commitment. And then... Well, what led you to make that decision? I just thought we should have a voice in what was going on in politics and who our elected representatives would be. We being... Uh, we, uh, rural Illinois. The farmer. Agriculture, the farmer. And so uh, I ran against him, and then I, was, I, I won and became a precinct committeeman. And uh, I was about 26, 27 at the time. I'd like to have you take a step back and very briefly explain uh, the politics of this region. Uh, this area is conservative um, um, and democratic. Uh, strange, but uh, very conservative, uh, but yet Democrats. I would say uh, at that time this, this community was 75-80% um, Democrat. And, uh, is this a New Deal Democrats or even farther back than that? Well, maybe. I, I, all I know is... Uh, sitting at the supper table one night, and my grandmother got so upset because my oldest sister, Mary Lou, happened to be dating this guy, evolving a distant relative, I mean, like fourth cousin, but doesn't she know that he's a Republican? <laughs> oh, okay, God forbid, you know. Uh, but I, I thought he was a nice guy, you know, but anyway, uh, was a I grew up in a Democrat family. And the Seamers in Tatapa is a Republican, and they're the ones that bought all the weed, were the richest people in town, and the Schultzes and Diedrichs, so maybe that's why I was a, uh, I was a Democrat. I don't know, but, but uh, um, I just felt as long as you were a, a working man, you, you had to be a Democrat. So. Can you, uh, it may put you on the spot here a little bit, how would you describe at that time your political philosophy, or did you even think about having one? Um, I think that I was uh, probably fiscal conservative, uh, uh, social liberal. But you didn't want the government to be telling you how to run your farm. No, absolutely not. I wanted to have a voice in some of those decisions that were being made because I saw a shift to more urban population than rural, and unless we brought those values and, and so forth to the uh, majority, we weren't going to be heard. Mm -hmm. So, And I think I cut you off. We've got you now on, is it the Effingham County Board? Well, no, not not there yet. I, okay. I was served as a precinct committeeman, okay. but then my, my supervisor, uh, who was a county board member, died in a bowling alley one night. 
and he had to be replaced. So my friends and neighbors came to me and said, Chuck, would you finish out his term, which is a 28-month or 27-month mm -hmm. what was term. What was his name? Sylvester Saruzan. And uh, he'd been a longtime Democrat politician. Anyway, so I agreed to take his place. And so I then was serving on the county board. And uh, all of a sudden, our state representative by the name of Chuck Keller decided he was going to retire. Uh, quit. His father had died, and he was going to come home, take care of the Keller Oil Company oil business. And, and so he waited till the Monday before the final date of filing in Springfield to to uh, uh, withdraw his candidacy. So we needed another candidate. Well, he says, oh, my aide can take my place. I said, I don't think so. You know, I didn't even know who in the world his aide was, but I knew a couple other people. I thought it'd be very good state representatives, and one was a guy by the name of Richard Brimmer, and so who happened to be a second or third cousin of mine. But anyway, from Bishop, you and probably so, had plenty of second or third cousins. Oh yeah, lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I decided, all right, we need to get Rich in, and so uh, I scurried around and helped and whatever, and we got enough petitions by Monday, five o'clock filing deadline, and got him to Springfield to file to get his name on the ballot. He was one of five, and and, uh, um, and this is again on the ballot for what position? State representative. Okay, and so uh, uh, we worked real hard between the filing date, which was around November or whatever, till April, and where the primary was to get him uh, nominated. He was one of five running for the position on the Democrat ticket for state for state representative. What year would this have been? Uh, 1984. Okay. And so, um, I looked at the, uh, uh, no, not 1984, 1976. It had to be in 76. And so, in 76, uh, Chuck Keller, the farmer state representative, uh, still alive today and run, doing quite well, come up to me and says, Chuck, what are you doing? Uh, my aide's going to win, and he's going to beat your guy like a ugly stepchild, you know, and so he, he's not going to win. You don't have enough money to beat me. And I says, I know, Chuck. I don't have enough money to beat you, but i got more time than you got because you're too busy, and, and I can go door to door for my guy, and we're going to beat you. We're going to win this primary. He says, no, no, no. Your Democrat county chairman is behind me as well, and so are all the precinct commitment. I says, I'm a precinct commitment, and nobody told me I had it before you. <laughs> and so uh, he says, well, I'll tell you what. Come the primary, when you're running for precinct commitment, you won't even make it anymore as a precinct commitment. I'll run somebody against you and beat you too. Oh, I said, okay, that's, that's fine with me. Let's go at it. And then, by the way, I says, that county chairman, I'm going to take him out too. <laughs> I was I was blowing smoke there, but anyway, I did. We won, and I took him out, and then took out the Democrat County Chairman of Effingham County, and I was Democrat County Chairman of Effingham County from '76 to 1984. You were, I was, the Democrat County Chairman. Not involved on the county board anymore. That had expired. I quit. Came home, uh, off the county zoning commission, all that out. I was the Democrat County Chairman for those eight or nine years from 76 to 1984. What, kind of, what kind of money does a Democrat County Chairman make? It cost me about $3,000 a year. <laughs> that would have been my guess. Yeah, it cost me about $3,000 a year, going to all these dinners and whatever and traveling around and speaking. And Anyway, I supported Rich Bremer, and in 1984... Terry Bruce, who was my Illinois senator, was elected to the United States Congress. He was one of the crazy eight. Maybe you remember him. I don't know. But anyway, he was he was one of the crazy eight, along with Don Clark Natch and that group. The anyway, crazy eight got the name because? There were eight people that were not expected to get elected to the Illinois Senate that year, and they did. And so when he was elected, he was a part of the crazy eight. Anyway, he had made it to... Congress. Rich Brimmer, who was our state representative at the time, politically we knew he was going to get appointed as a judge. As soon as the election was over with, whether he won or lost, he was going to be appointed as a circuit judge here. And so two seats were available, the Illinois Senate, 54th, and the 
107th representative seat. Well, being involved as Democrat county chairman for eight, nine years, I had gotten together and known all the county ch or the county chairman in the six counties, seven counties of the 107th district, and most of the county chairman in the 108th district. Um, long story short, it came down to 17 votes difference between the two 108th and 107th district. I announced I wanted to be a uh, Illinois senator. I couldn't get enough votes. I cut a deal with Senator Bill O'Daniel. He was going to be uh, Bill O'Daniel, who was a retired state representative. He was going to take the job as state senator for to finish out the two-year terms of Terry Bruce and then two more years on his own for four years. And then he was going to retire and quit, and I was going to then run for Illinois Senate. Well, he didn't do that. He didn't quit. He kept running. But I was appointed to be the state representative. Now, somewhere along here from 1968, come back from Vietnam, is that I don't want anything to do with politics, to kind of being drafted at the local level to be a precinct uh, committeeman. And then somewhere along here, it sounds like you got, got bit by the political bug as well. Uh, I think it was my doctor's fault in Mayo Clinic. He told me that, um, uh, Chuck, your ankles are so bad, you, you're going to have to find a different play way to make a living other than uh, using your muscles and so forth. You better start using your brains. And so um, I couldn't walk anymore. Uh, my ankles were so bad with arthritis. This was back in 1980, uh, um, I guess, somewhere, somewhere in that, that time period. And so the opportunity arose for me to become a state legislator. Uh, they cost me $117 with the phone calls and gasoline, making trips back and forth to, uh, and that was a lot of money back then, to um, uh, you know, convince these county chairmen to, to vote for me with their weighted votes, and they did. And so that I won election, uh, the election, to take the oath of office in January of, of uh, 1985, along with everybody else. Uh, won re-election again in uh, 86, um, 88, uh, 90, uh, 92, uh, 94, uh, 96, 98, uh, every two years uh, for 18 and a half years. And then uh, the governor was elected, Governor Rob Bogovich, and he appointed me the director of agriculture. Okay. Well, I want to spend quite a bit more time about your your period as a legislator, but okay. before we move too far into that, okay. uh, my impression is you certainly did not turn your back on farming, though. How did uh, you maintain the farm during those years? I had some very good very good help. Um, a guy by the name of Bill Jansen um, worked uh, for my brother for a while. Uh, earlier in that, I, I had to... A guy named Mark uh, Gebbin. Mark Gebbin came on the yard here when, uh, oh shoot, he was 16 years old on a little moped. Uh, lived in T-Town and, and his dad was uh, a wannabe farmer. Uh, Gene Gebbin married one of Joe Dater's, my neighbor's daughters over here. And, and um, he always wanted to farm and it was in Mark's blood. And he just wanted to farm. He just wanted to raise pigs. So, okay, fine. Well, you know about raising pigs? He said, nothing. I said, good. <laughs> well, you don't want him to know all. If he knew everything about it, he'd be doing it on his own. If he didn't know anything about it, he had to learn. He had to learn my way. And so um, I taught him everything he knows about uh, raising raising hogs. Uh, Mark worked for me for eight or nine years. Uh, I went to the University of Illinois, graduated with a degree in, in uh, animal science. Uh, today he's a uh, past president, of, I think he's past president of pork producers, a state of Illinois, lives at Casey, raises all kinds of, uh, raises all kinds of hogs. Now I was from the hogs end. Now from the grain end, I had uh, Bill Jansen, um, who um, started with me. Um, um, he worked for my brother Jerry first when I rented Jerry's place. Well then, I rented him as well with a hired hand. Mm. And uh, brought him up, paid him quite well. He farms now on his own and raises probably, uh, he probably has a thousand acres that he rents or leases and owns combination. So they've all done very well. Yeah. Um, I took him in under my wing. I gave him uh, 
total management authority and trust here because I was gone. I couldn't be thicker and seed corn and whatever uh, every day to, to manage an operation, an hog operation. I had to trust someone, and so these are two guys I did. Uh, uh, Ron Permer is another guy that worked for me for, for quite a while. What were your goals then when you first entered the legislature? How would you want to define success at that point in time? I just wanted to make sure that uh, everything that I voted for or against was in the best interest of, of agriculture in general. Just not this area, but agriculture in, in general, short term as well as long term. Talk about the, uh, the boundaries of your district. Start off with, there were uh, Effingham, Clay, Jasper, Richland, Lawrence, and Crawford counties, uh, a little bit of Edwards. That was the 107th district. And uh, then I went through a reapportionment, and it was all of Crawford, all of Lawrence, all of Clay, all of Richland, uh, all of Effingham. And then we get really got goofy, it got to, or half of Effingham. And then it really got goofy at uh, this was in the 108th district, and then it was uh, parts of Effingham, all of Clay, Richland, uh, none of Lawrence, uh, Edwards, White, Wabash, Hamilton, and Wayne counties. And how many uh, state legislators were there at the time? Well, there always has been 118. 118. What amazes me is the geographical spread that you had for this one district in Illinois. This is a huge swath of land it, that it you is, uh, It is a huge. It's all our parts right now of uh, 10 counties, uh, going from uh, White County, Carmi, uh, all the way up here to, to Effingham. And what's the largest city that you represented? To begin with was Effingham. Boy, I don't know. Uh, uh, to end it, uh, I only had a third of Effingham, and uh, uh, you've got Flora, uh, you've got uh, Olney, nine thousand, you've got uh, um, Fairfield, uh, five six thousand. That, that's probably it. But it sounds like for the, your entire term, the eighteen and a half years, you represented an area that was overwhelmingly mm -hmm. dominated mm -hmm. by agriculture. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to talking to one of my uh, colleagues, Terry Stetso, who lives in the South Chicago. He says he can, he can stand on one street corner and he can wave at half of his population going to work <laughs> every morning. And in the evening, if he stood there, he'd wave at the other half going home. I says, Terry, if I stood in the center of my geographic district, I could wave at the same guy holding manure 15 times <laughs> that day. I'd have his vote. <laughs> But not many more folks. <laughs> okay, um, I'm I'm wondering when you first go up to Springfield, and uh, you start meeting some of your fellow uh, legislators. What was your reaction? What was um, what were you thinking? I guess I uh, wish I'd had a college education. It was one. But the longer I was there, the more I realized they put their pants on the same way I did. And it just took someone to sit and listen. You didn't have to be the great orator, but you had to be able to listen and understand. And then you'd have to trust those people that are telling you the truth. And that's that was the difficult part. How do you know what they're saying is absolutely mm -hmm. fact? I probably am going to make too much of this, but I've been dying to ask you, meeting some of the Democrats from Chicago, from a different frame of reference that they were coming from where you were at as a Democrat down here in South Central Illinois. Mm -hmm. um, what was your, uh, what were your thoughts on, on them and, and their political motivations and their political philosophy? Well, I always felt sometimes they got frustrated with me because I didn't understand where they were coming from. And you know what? I bet they were the same about me. Harky, you just don't understand where I'm coming from. So I started something uh, my first year in office. I went through the first January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August. And we lost contact with them until I met him again in January, back in session. So I said, we're going to do something different. We've got a lack of communication here. Lack of communication. You don't know what I'm about, and I don't know what you're about, so why don't you come down and see me? 
And so I started what's known as a downstate legislative tour. And I went to the city of Effingham and I said, look, we're rural. You're rural. I need some help. I want to bring all the legislators, senators and, and representatives down to Effingham to show them what agriculture and rural Illinois is all about. I went to the car dealers and I said, would you furnish vans? And I went to the Hotel Motel Association in Effingham in the chamber and I said, would you provide hotel rooms? Uh, Ludwig Lumber, would you buy a hotel room for a night for a legislator? Yeah, sure. You know, $35. That's all it was mm -hmm. back then. Not a $200, $35, a nice room. Put them all up in Keller's from out in. And the first year, I think I had 20-some legislators from Chicago, senators and representatives and their families, girlfriends, whoever, didn't matter to me, down here for three days. We took them out to Lake Sarah. We took them to World Color Press. We took them to my farm. We took them to a dairy farm. We took them to um, Seymour Milling Company where we made flour. We, uh, we, we just toured, and we gave them an opportunity. Or you want to play golf all day. Or you want to go fishing at Lake Sarah. Or you just want to lay around the hotel. But here's the options you have available. It says, well, I would like to see a dairy farm. Okay, fine. I have a van pick you up at 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and you and your wife and whatever will we'll, we'll take you out to the dairy farm. Here's what you should wear. And so this is all prearranged. And so we gave the legislators a downstate perspective. Now that you're done for the... We're going to go over to, to the Smith farm. We're going to bail hay this afternoon. We're going to go along. <laughs> anyway, so we did this. And the next year, I had 37 legislators. When's the last time you saw 37 legislators downstate at anything other than a funeral? Mm -hmm. It just don't happen. Yeah, a lot of the same people, second time around? And uh, some, but not all. But everybody talked about it all year long. And when they got back, he says, man, that was great. You know, It didn't, it didn't cost me a thing. And it didn't. I whined and dined them. Because the Chamber of Commerce here in Effingham, the Effingham County Farm Bureau, the Hotel Motel Association, the New Car Dealers Association, all picked up the tab. Uh, breakfast, dinner, supper, the whole ball of wax, any place they wanted to go. They wanted to go fishing, they wanted to go play golf. And a couple did play golf. That's all they did when they were down here. But they enjoyed Southern Illinois and just played golf. Did they reciprocate visits to the big city? I was invited uh, back, but nobody ever tried to put together a tour like that again. Mm -hmm. Did this pay dividends for you? Absolutely. Because people then understood what I was about, what rural Illinois was about in agriculture. When I said, you want money for your roads in Chicago, and I understand that. You got potholes. We got roads down here that are 12 feet wide, and when you meet somebody in the next bridge, you got to give because your boat can't cross that one lane mm -hmm. bridge. I said, ah, come on. I said, there are roads down south where we have school buses that are dust and dirt and gravel roads yet. Ah, oh, come on. So I instructed my guys to, when they took them anywhere, take the long way around and take them. And by the way, the drivers were the young farmers uh, of Effingham County. Sure. And they took them the back way to where we were going. And so, sure, they understood, and it paid dividends, and uh, in respect to the General Assembly that, that I did represent rural Illinois. Well, I know uh, always a measure for some legislators is how much uh, money you'll be able to bring back to the district, or, or pork, if you will. I mean, uh -huh. that's probably a fitting word in, sure. in your line of business. Was that something that you tried to do? Uh, absolutely. I think that was important. Um, tell me about what the family was doing and how they dealt with you being gone so much of the time. I assume you did not drive back and forth from Springfield no. every day. No, I stayed in, I stayed in Springfield. I had an, had an apartment that I shared in, in Springfield with uh, uh, Terry Stetzel for quite some time, uh, South Cook County. And then um, my last stint was with uh, a guy by the name of Louis Lang. Uh, Lou Lang. Lou Lang uh, from, of course, Skokie. And that was a very diverse uh, uh, setting for, for Lou and I. Uh, I was a, a Catholic uh, white boy conservative Democrat from downstate, uh, Lou being a, um, a wealthy Jewish guy from Skokie, attorney <laughs> at law, uh, just uh, somewhat liberal. You know, that, that, uh, but we had many very interesting discussions uh, at night. 
Yeah, a lot to to chew over every night. I would think. Absolutely. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, committee appointments did you get? Oh, uh, over the years, I think I had them all. Uh, I was on the agriculture committee every year uh, that I served the eighteen and a half years. Um, never was chairman, vice chairman uh, since almost day one. Um, because those were Republican years. No. Um, I was uh, in the House, and there was only two years when uh, when uh, the, the Republicans controlled the Illinois House under Lee Daniels. Mm-hmm. Uh, 93, 94, I believe. Who was the chairman of the Ag Committee all those years? Oh, God. Bruce Richmond was chairman for a number of years. But it didn't matter because I was still the senior member and leading spokesperson. <laughs> so... Wait, are you telling me you were the dominant force on the committee? Uh, I'm being very humble. Uh, I was the uh, uh, vice chairman many times and senior member. Okay. Uh, yeah, so. What were some of the initiatives you, you uh, sponsored or were important during that time frame? Well, a, a big issue was uh, property tax and taxation, you know, which we were going through. Environmental concerns. Uh, the Livestock Facilities Management Act is, was a big one as well. Can you talk about some of those in more detail for me? Uh, sure. You know, uh, taxation, everybody's wanting to get at uh, uh, you know, agriculture because agriculture is exempt from a lot of things. One of the things that um, uh, the Department of Revenue and the administration of, I want to say Edgar administration, wanted to uh, make sure they got every tax dollar they possibly could um, one of the things they were wanting to start taxing was bull semen. Not something normally would be at the top of your list, I would think. Well, uh, you know, we had an audit, audit made of one of my local businesses here, and uh, a IRS or a revenue agent came in and says, "Look, you're not, you've not been paying your uh, tax on your uh, bull semen that you're you're selling." <laughs> and the guy says, uh, "Well, uh, anything used in." The, line of agriculture production or reproduction is sales tax exempt. He says, yeah, but this is frozen and everything else. And you send a technician out, and it's just not natural. So it's, it's, it's artificial insemination, and it's, it doesn't say anything about that in the tax code. And, uh, so you're, we're going to tax you. If you don't like it, suck it up. So I, whoa. So my guy called me, a local business guy, and he says, uh, you know, I'm going to owe these guys $122,000 uh, back taxes and penalties, and that's just, excuse me. Yeah, well, he was selling, I don't know if you know, the dairy semen is quite expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he would have to uh, um, go pay for seven years back or whatever, plus penalties. And, and I says, no, nothing is more natural than bull semen as far as reproduction and agriculture. And so uh, I went to the Department of Revenue, and it says, you don't have the guts, you know, use that term, you don't have those well, gonads to, to make and talk about this publicly. And I says, you want to bet? And so I took him to task, and today bull semen is exempt in the state of Illinois as well as hog semen. Uh, but horse semen is not if it's used in racehorse production. Mm. But I can't imagine what newspaper would not want to have a headline in it. Uh, Charles Corralt gave me a call uh, early one morning when I was in the shower, <laughs> wanting to talk about this on Good Morning America. And uh, some of the other initiatives you talked about. Well, we we spent about two and a half, three years working with the uh, um, various committees on the Livestock Facilities Management Act, which which uh, creates the atmosphere and permit process for the construction and, and expansion of the livestock industry in Illinois. And I imagine that was a very contentious issue, and we've talked about that a little bit already. Yeah, very contentious. Was that an issue where um, you found you you were able to find some allies on both sides of the political fence? Absolutely, because, you know, um, you're talking about food production. Mm -hmm. And whether you like it or don't like it, uh, uh, you you know, the smell, there's something you just had to put up with. And so we compromised uh, uh, a lot uh, to to get this bill put in place. And there's still some people that are not very happy with it. They want it to be more restrictive. Uh, I think it is somewhat uh, 
uh, it was a bill ahead of its time compared to what other states have. We may have lost some production to, to other states, but I think that all in all, I think it was a, a well thought out, well balanced uh, piece of uh, legislation. Did it put some limits on the scale of some of these hog operations? Uh, it it did. Uh, it may have helped, uh, um, or, or I say, hurt some economic development in in some of these counties uh, that were so adamant. One of the good things that we did is we put the control in the General Assembly and not in the county local board's hands. Although we always believe in local control, uh, in this instance, uh, local control would not be a good thing. Local control is available in legislation in Iowa, and there have been permits requested in most counties in Iowa to produce hogs, uh, but there's very few counties that do, simply because local control pushes them out. Uh, there's a lot of fallacies to say that, uh, you know, if you have livestock in a, in a county, it hurts uh, property values. Um, to the contrary, in Iowa, after a research project has been done, those counties that accept uh, livestock operations in their counties are better off with a tax base, population growth, and everything else because of all the jobs and activities that take place in and around livestock operations. For those counties that have chased them out, there's no tax base, the population is leaving, and schools are having a tough time, mm. and there's just no jobs available. So you, you have your, the absolute opposite is true of what people are saying, or was saying, I mean, that livestock is good for the economy. Mm. Now you mentioned environmental issues as well. Did, were you able to be involved in some environmental legislation? Not that what we just talked about isn't. Uh, yeah, you know, we talk about uh, pesticides and insecticides, herbicides, and all these things. We know that honeybees are a very important part of reproduction. Uh, Illinois is number one in pumpkin production. A little known fact. Right. Uh, there's an 80% probability that if you're eating pumpkin pie out of a uh, out of a can in you know, the pie filling, there's an 80% probability that comes from Illinois. From around Morton, most likely. Yes, yes, up in up in that area, lots of pumpkins production. Uh, we also, I think, are probably number one in jack o' lantern production for Walmart here in Southern Illinois, grown at Carmine. <laughs> now, uh, pumpkin production is directly attributed to uh, the use of honeybees. And honeybees are killed with pesticides and insecticides, so there's got to be a balance here in nature that we don't kill all of the uh, the honeybees. And so. Uh, yeah, we, we worked on legislation such as that. Also, the Illinois Insurance Grain Code. Pardon Grain, me? grain Insurance Code here in Illinois. Okay. We have one of the best um, uh, insurance uh, programs uh, available in any of the uh, states in the United States. And I uh, work with that as uh, when I was Director of Agriculture with the National Association of State Departments okay. of Agriculture as well. Well, that's getting a little bit ahead of our story. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Um, how about finding markets for some of Illinois' agricultural products? Uh, I try my very best to, to do that. I was somewhat um, uh, held back uh, on on that, uh, but that's said of myself too, in, in the as director of, of, of agriculture. But uh, of course, we promoted uh, uh, livestock is, uh, in, in Illinois since day one. Matter of fact, the first business card I ever had was. Um, on the back side, it's just on the front side, it just says Chuck Hardkey Hog Farmer. On the back side, it says if you would eat more pork, uh, hog prices would go up and I could afford a bigger business card. <laughs> I just, I printed it on a half a card. Okay, you know, the regular length, but just cut it in half so it was uh, about three quarters of an inch uh, wide. Now, I know you're involved in an awful lot of other committees, uh, education, veterans affairs, right. appropriations, transportation. Any uh, work in some of those other committees that uh, comes to the forefront for you as well? Well, I think that uh, I've also served uh, as uh, uh, county and townships or local governments committee, and I think that that's very important. Uh, local committees and local counties and townships are actually the grassroots of what it's all about. Uh, education is center to uh, uh, the growth in any community. A good school uh, is going to mean good jobs and good uh, good kids and, and productive uh, citizens. So uh, all these committees are, are very important and, and I've served on all of them, some more than others. Transportation without the, uh, proper roads and delivery, we wouldn't be uh, going anywhere. So mm -hmm. um, 
there's not a committee in the Illinois House that's not important. Uh, they're all very important. During these 18 and a half years, did you consider ever running for higher office? Yes. Uh, I, I formed a committee to explore the possibility of running for the United States Congress to uh, replace uh, Congressman Glenn Pichard, who uh, lived up to his commitment of a 10-year um, term limit, uh, self-imposed, unlike some other politicians I know. Uh, he lived up to that commitment and uh, quit after 10 years. And I, I thought about taking his place, formed a committee, uh, went to Washington, D.C., uh, spent a month out there. It only took three days. But I, it seemed like a month, and uh, I came back home, made a decision that's not for me. It's too big an arena for this small country boy to, to handle. So. That was the, the essence of it, or was there something else you encountered out in Washington, D.C.? That No, I just felt that it was so big and so cold and so whatever. I'd built up enough seniority here in the Illinois House that uh, uh, I didn't... I didn't, I didn't want to leave it. Um, to go out in Washington, D.C., unless you're there 10, 12 years before you ever get chairman of a subcommittee. Uh, here in Illinois, I was chairman of whatever I wanted to be. Uh, I had enough seniority already, and so uh, um, I, I just did not want to take the chance to move. Your uh, accomplishment during the, your many years in the legislature that you're most proud of? Uh, I guess I was never indicted. <laughs> <laughs> and in Even Illinois, that, that's saying something. saying something, right? Uh, no, I, I, I think my accomplishment is just uh, uh, never losing an election. Uh, always had uh, support of uh, the people and, and uh, support of the uh, uh, speaker. Uh, wound up as uh, majority, one well, of the assistant majority leader. Um, Uh, I, I don't know where to start with the main projects that I did bring bring home to the district from schools in Bridgeport to senior centers and centers in Crawford County to waterworks, um, you know, just. Would you say that farmers in Illinois are better off because of the work that you and others had taken the initiative to I pursue? think that uh, farmers in Illinois ought to be really proud of the few members that they have that represent them in the Illinois General Assembly. When you look at the population of Illinois, um, the 13 million people, um, there's only uh, 73,000 farm families in Illinois anymore. And uh, although the people that live in Effingham are not farmers, uh, they are rural. And uh, we have, uh, I guess, about a fourth of the population living in small communities in, in mm -hmm. Illinois, the rest of the major centers. Uh, we have about eight or nine uh, good agricultural representatives in the Illinois House, one or two in the Illinois Senate, and uh, they do a tremendous job holding the, the fort down for agriculture in Illinois. I, I cannot imagine why we do not have more support from our urban uh, colleagues, uh, simply because um, the, the lifeblood the food and the water um, that are needed to sustain life come from from the mm. farms. So. I think this is a softball. Um, I'm going to throw at you here. Okay. Um, 73,000 families in Illinois, that's a tiny minority of the overall state population. Um, what's the largest industry in Illinois? If uh, It's agriculture. Uh, one out of every four jobs is directly or indirectly related to agriculture. But they don't see it that way. And people don't just, just don't see it that way. They they take it for granted. When you when you see a, a a truck running up and down the road today, whether it be milk or orange juice or or a product that's that's that started somewhere in agriculture, uh, to delivering the the bread and the grocery or the plastic bags to to put the bread in. That that's all revolves around uh, food production and, and agriculture. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very important for the soap that's kept things clean, and it's, it's, uh, and it's uh, merchandise mart up in Chicago, and it's the Chicago Board of Trade, and it's yeah, it, Deer all the, and all ADM those jobs and Staley, right. and okay, one last question for this session for you: 
I, I know you can answer this one. What does it take today to be a successful farmer? A very wealthy father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you must be a very good uh, politician, uh, educator, uh, welder, uh, electrician, engineer, uh, financier, uh, everything possible to be a successful farmer in Illinois. You don't have to own any land, but you better be good at managing with what you have. Now, you did it without attending college. Would you recommend that to your no. son or your son-in-law today? No. I would not. I was born in a different era. Um, um, in, in my graduating class, there were probably uh, well, there were 23 boys out of the 44 kids in my high school graduating class. I think there were about six or seven that, mm, girls or, and boys together that, that went to college. Well, thank you very much, Chuck. It's been a blast to talk to you. <laughs>